Mark, what is going on, dude? Well, I have a couple of questions for you, Eli. I'm glad you're sitting down. Um, so I understand you were two-timing me this week with another podcast. Yeah, that's right. What about it? I'm a, I'm a, I like the prowl. <laughs> I guess I, I'm a man on the prowl. <laughs> you getting around this week? <laughs> no, uh, you did a, you did a guest spot on uh, Hella Nineties with Ryan Bitters, right? That's what. That's that's right. Hella Nineties, Ryan Bitters, um, and it just came out to, uh, and it did. Are we doing the thing for? Am well, I it that? landed. It landed last week, uh, yeah. last Wednesday. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, pretty cool. Pretty cool. I'm like, so I've got to check this out. Yeah, he he called me up and said, "Hey, man, um, can we do? Let's do one where we talk about the transition from the '80s to the '90s." And I said, "Dude, but your show's called Hell in '90s. It's all about the '90s." He says, "Yeah, but we want to talk about th that transition with the music and whatnot." And we got into why, you know, I my thoughts on big hair metal bands and what happened and all. All that yeah. stuff. So that's on the cool. latest episode of Hella Nineties. Pretty cool. I tell you what, I'll I'll uh, we get finished recording here. I'll put a link up on it on our official Trampled Underfoot podcast Facebook page, so y'all can. I'll put a link to it. You can go to the Spreaker page and listen to it. It's a uh, it's pretty entertaining. It's a, it's a fun show. Yeah. Uh, uh, Ryan does a good job over there. He's a he's a good guy. So. So yeah, man. Um, so well, I just thought it was interesting because I kept seeing your name pop up with all these podcasts. I'm like, dang, man, this guy gets around. <laughs> hey, you know what? I mean, you only live once. You might as well be in like 25 to 30 different podcasts. <laughs> You're a star, man. You're a star. <laughs> yeah, it's a funny thing, but um, you know, I find podcasts to be the new YouTube video because it's a pain in the butt to do. YouTube videos, um, the way the algorithms, I mean, people, you know, if you have an opinion on anything, you're going to have people that are going to be contrarians to it, rightly so, because your opinion doesn't necessarily mean it's it's the actual, you know, fact of the matter. But I'm telling you, this podcast uh, format, you get to shoot the breeze, share, it's entertaining, and you don't have the sort of ownery task of building up these edits, let's say, video-wise, plus a project in the case of what we do, mm -hmm. put it out there, and then crickets across, you know, across the world. That's Which right. Be, right? Yeah. Uh, and and I uh, editing a podcast is completely different from editing a video. I mean, number one, you don't have the visual aspect of it. So that's just gone. And everybody, you know, you know what I've got. I've got this tinny little headset that sounds like I'm halfway, not quite, but almost halfway into a Folgers coffee can, the plastic ones, not the tin ones. Yeah. And, you know, th and have my treble turned way up and the bass turned way down. But you can go in and you can edit that audio and make it sound pretty decent with free software, free programs, editing a podcast. I mean, I take my time at it and two to three hours for a one hour podcast, it's done. Yeah. And, and you know, you don't have to worry about, you just have to worry about continuity because you can go in and you can snip out little silent, awkward pauses. Or if you get a word wrong, you can, you know, restate what you said and go back and cut out the mistake. I mean, it, it, it's a heck of a lot easier than editing video. I, I like yeah. it a lot. And also and also the, the return on investment is fantastic because we're just shooting the breeze like we would anyhow, um, except we do take into consideration topical, you know, conversations for the fact that, well, we're doing a thing. But with the YouTube video, and you know what? It's okay to be controversial because yeah, you know, the, the least controversial stuff, you know, there was this video and it's talking about, you know, how come and algorithms and all that. And it's a very su successful channel. And he, at the end of it, it's like a 20 minute video. He said that I'm going to have to do click baby, click baby, um, uh, titles and, and pictures because that's what it's, is trending. He, he explained the whole thing in such a very, I forget, I wish I could share with, in fact, I'll search for it and I'll post it also on our trampled underfoot page on Facebook, but controversy 
is super important. So I'm going to be controversial right now. I'm going to mix things up. I'm sorry, Mark. But mm -hmm. Steve Nealon, Harneal Media, we've been trying to get him on tonight so because he was going to participate in the in the three. And I, I suspect, and I'm going to mix it up right now because that's uh -oh. what the world is built on. I uh -oh. suspect that he was pulling our chain because he just didn't want to come up on here. <laughs> Steve, I would, Steve is famous for not wanting to be on video. He's great. He's fine with being on audio. He'll join in. I mean, if you go to our website, trappledunderfootpodcast.com, click that Wayback Machine and go back and check a few episodes. Steve has joined us yeah. on the podcast before. We did but, the Las Vegas one with him, too, when we were talking about Vegas. And yep. um, he also talked about something that he finds fascinating. We didn't know about and he told us about, which is um, people have video uh, channels on YouTube where all they do is um, do scratch offs and people send them scratch offs and all that. And, yeah. and that's what they do. And they're successful at just scratching off lotto tickets, scratching off lottery tickets. And uh, something I'll talk to you about a little bit later. I found another rabbit hole. That's a similar type of rabbit hole that I've been down for the last three days, but I'll talk to you about that later on. It may or may not end up being in the podcast. We'll see. But, uh, yeah, we, uh, so you think that Steve was not really having, uh, <laughs> I think that Steve waited in the balance and he said, I could totally picture Steve going, uh, you know, now to be fair with Steve, I'm trying to mix things up. You know, I totally, yeah. of course, believe what you say, but at see, now I'm not being controversial anymore because yeah. I've, I've conceded to the thing. Um, but I think that, that controversial is the way in other words controversy even if it's not acceptable i think that's the way to go but with youtube videos it don't matter you're lost in an ocean maybe not you but mm -hmm. in an and it is like i i swear to you i made that darn b mm -hmm. I, I i segmented the abdomen i the carving with the dremel i turned stuff on i did what's that um resin and for what i mean in it, in it of itself, it was a beautiful finish. And it, and it still is. And it's one of the, it is the most awesome thing I have ever seen you make. I mean, it is absolutely fantastic. And folks, if you haven't been to Rockin' Woodworks, not Rockin' H. That guy has enough viewers. We want some of his. Go over to Rockin' H and tell him to go drop the H and get the H out of there and come over and see Eloy stuff. And... <laughs> and it, Rockin' Woodworks and check out that B video, man. You will not be disappointed. It's flipping amazing. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. I do want to say this, though. When you say, when so you just did a beautiful thing because, you know, you're like saying, hey, uh, folks, go over and, and, and check it. But now once you introduce in that whole set, because, you know, people's attention spans. So once you introduce the alternative one, which you're saying, folks, remember, don't go to Rockin' H. Don't well, when you introduce the the people you know and they might be drinking coffee this or that they'll say oh he said go to Rock and H. <laughs> so no, no, no 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 no. That's why I said twice. Get the H out of there. Forget that H. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing but love for you, Drew. Nothing but love for you, Mister Short. Well, Jamie Page has that same issue. Yeah. Um, he's JP Woodwork. Uh, so for a long time, just joking around because I. I know how people are. It's not that they do it intentionally, but if you tell me a series of words and you give me a link to go to that I have to type in, and if you do something like I used to do to Jamie Page, folks, don't forget to go visit JP Woodwork without the S, not Aww. Woodworks, and I'd extend the S. And then <laughs> so there's a, a competition. But anyways, I appreciate that, Mark. Um, so, well, yeah. hey, nothing but the truth, man. That thing is flipping fantastic. It really is. It's cool. Well, it I appreciate cool. it, man. But oh. in the long, in the long short of it, it itself, and by the way, the video, I mean, I did a lot of editing to it and this and that. At the end of the day, when you compare it to a a podcast where we're free flowing and this and that, yes, there's a creation process going on. But who the heck is watching these? I I don't know. The algorithm, I don't know, so I'm not too happy. Here's controversy, but the YouTube thing, I think that they that they're rigging the system totally. But you know, we're not here for that today. I just wanted to throw that out there. Well, we're talking about controversial subjects and what have you, and, and I have to take a brief aside here. 
Uh, let me let me just kind of acknowledge the YouTube crowd out here. We've got a bunch of people in the YouTube live chat. If you hit our YouTube channel, uh, look for us, Trampled Underfoot Podcast on YouTube. We record these sessions live. Hit that subscribe button, ring that bell, and when we go live, you'll get a notification. So you can check us out live. But there's a few people out there saying, oh, well, I have a face for radio. You're perfect for podcasting then. Yeah. You've got no excuses. You don't appear on video. You can just talk to. And and if you go over to Spreaker, Spreaker.com, S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R, just like a speaker, but add an R. Spreaker.com, you sign up. All you do is sign up and you get a free 15-minute podcast. Every day. You can do a 15-minute podcast every day. It doesn't cost you a dime. You just record some audio, upload it, pick out some uh, artwork, you know, uh, come up with a logo, do whatever, post it, and boom, you're a star. You have a podcast. Absolutely free. doesn't cost you a dime. That's right. So now that our contractual obligations are done and over with, what should we talk about? Well, yesterday um – we kind of both uh, uh, of us were like totally spent. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> big time. So, so, but we did talk about what was happening and I guess it's a good thing to talk about what's going on as far as the moon landing and stuff. You had something to, uh, well, I think we would be remiss not to acknowledge it, not to talk about it because um, this 2019 is the 50th anniversary of a lot of important events. And one of the biggest was started 50 years ago yesterday when three astronauts blasted off from Florida uh, on the way to the moon. Apollo 11. Now, I say yesterday. As we record this, it is Wednesday, July 17th. They took off July 16th, 1969, headed for the moon. And by the time this comes out on the podcast, all of this will be in the past, of course. Uh, the 21st, they actually stepped foot on the moon. They landed on the 20th. Six hours later, they actually stepped out of the Eagle, the uh, lander, and walked on the moon. Amazing. And, and I can't think of many events that are bigger so, you know, I thought it would be something interesting to talk about. I mean, we, we have to at least acknowledge it. This was a this was a, a world changing event. You know, I was eight years old, so I don't remember a whole heck of a lot about it. And I was a twinkle or not even a twinkle. Yeah. In, in my daddy's eye. Yeah. You weren't even born yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I came what for. Years that what, what year did it? 69? 1969. So, so six years after. Six years later, yeah. It it be, it, it all been done already by the time yep. I got around. Yep. Everything so was, happened by the time news. I got around. Right. I, in fact, I, I it was old news by then, and I think the Apollo program had had ended by that time. I mean, by the time I come around, we've gone to the moon. Frickin' rock and roll was at its zenith because all the cool bands come out. Um, I mean, obviously, all of the cool stuff in history. And what did I get? Bell bottoms, the adults walking around with bell bottoms and yeah. freaking or plaid freaking sports jackets or whatever. Um, yeah, but, but on the other side of that coin, you were young enough that you more or less escaped disco. So that's still that that rates right up there. Well, it could have been worse. <laughs> I could have had the problem that Ryan Ryan's claim to the 90s ni the de decade of the 90s fame was pencils with different colors, which which we had to explain to him. We already had from back in the day. <laughs> so so at least the 70s was sort of like but still. Yeah. I Their mean, claim it, to fame is that little pencil that you that pen and you put the <laughs> yellow, the green, <laughs> a whole a whole decade. Yeah, but you know, hey, you, you you pick what's important to you and you identify with what leaves an impression on you. Well, heck, I mean, <laughs> but yeah, the the moon landing it was it was it was definitely the hugest event that I remember of that year, and that's. That's kind of a bold statement to say because a lot of things happened that year. 
I mean, we got another anniversary coming up next month that I'm not going to talk about right this minute because I, I'm studying up on a few things. But uh, there were several things at play there. First of all, there were only three networks on TV. If you were lucky enough to live in a large major, major metropolitan area, um, you had UHF channels, which people, a lot of people don't know what that is now anyway. But, so, and it was on every channel. I mean, they were live. There's guys walking around up on the moon. Now, true, we're watching it on a little 19-inch black and white TV set. I'm laying on the floor in the living room watching this. And I can still remember being absolutely blown away that there were people up there walking around on the moon. And it just kind of jump-started the imagination. I mean, I knew there was a space program. I knew there were astronauts. But I thought all they did was go up into space and orbit the Earth and get out and take a walk and come back in and land. I didn't, you know, I'm a kid. I don't know from any of that stuff. I thought the exciting part was the ride up to space and everything else just looked like work to me. <laughs> but and then, then you see that they land on the moon. But then I see these guys walking around on the moon and they're hopping around like kids, you know, just having a good old time bouncing all over the place, learning. They, they figured out that the easiest way to get around was not to try to walk, but to just bounce basically. So that's how they did it. They kind of skipped and bounced to get around. And I just thought that was intriguing as heck. And I think I learned more in the, in the months following about gravity, about Earth, about the moon, than, you know, it, it just made me interested. I wanted to learn this stuff. And I it did it for a lot of kids. It was a major topic of discussion in school, too. So it was really something. It was really something. So and, go ahead. Oh, go, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, um, and the conspiracy theories were born. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Is well, that where you were going? That's where I was going to go. So okay. if you do any YouTube uh, searching, and for me, I, you know, the other day, remember that that channel I told you that he talked about. Okay, do you guys remember out there and Mark that there was a a viral video where a guy um, goes to this reservoir, and the reservoir is full of black floating balls, and they use it for a reason. I think it's so that the algae, the sunlight, doesn't create like a film over that reservoir, something like that. But he posted that video, and it just went mammothly savage um, viral. Mm -hmm. And um, he's had a few viral ones, but that went really viral. And he's got a video explaining his thoughts about the whole thing. And he's a very, um, you know, conscientious uh, sort of – he really sits and says, well, this, 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 and that. And he takes in and he writes it down, and he, you know, talks with, with the audience about what his thoughts are. Uh, as far as chasing algorithms, um, he, he basically came to the conclusion that that the creator notices signals about the environment of YouTube and they begin to search uh, or go after the algorithm. The algorithm is is seeking what's pe what people are searching for, but there's a delay in that cycle. So um, the, he said that YouTube has this this want or a, a opinion or assumption that YouTube wants to believe that content creators, generally speaking, don't, or YouTube video makers, don't um, go after the algorithm and search. They're just doing what they do. But the reality is that if I see a trend or a pattern, you know, any of us, you know, at whatever level you are, I mean, there's differing, there's always going to be someone that's going to come out and say, well, not me, because my way of doing it, I understand. But mm -hmm. in, in, in the whole, you know, right. planetary, you know, in, in the environment, people tend to look at trends and in their minds, they start to justify. And then that's why you get a lot of Jimmy DeResta videos with no audio. Right. Um, I got you know, two, from two words for you, fidget spinners. 
Look at how many fidget spinners came out when those things were huge. And now you can't, you can't find. Yeah. yeah. So his whole, exactly. So his whole thing is that these content creators are searching for um, the algorithm because the algorithm is signaling what people, what viral videos are, are going to, you know, happen. But the, the algorithm is chasing what, the people are typing in and so there's always this whole thing so he came to the conclusion you could never um know and but the one th but the one thing that they are gearing towards he did a great job i'm gonna link it i'm gonna find it a link it on our facebook page trampled okay. underfoot podcast f f facebook because it's really it's long it's about 20 minutes long but when he gets going he gives some awesome sort of clearing of of, of the cobwebs in the head of, of what the story is. And in conclusion, he's explaining that, you know, to, to do the YouTube thing um, you, and you want to be successful, the, the um, thumbnails have to really pop out. I mean, you really have to grab them and yeah. the titles you have to. And of course, so he said, you're going to have to excuse me, but um, I'm going to have to do clickbaity titles because that's the environment that they're, they, they're creating. It, it, they're creating that environment because right. the natural tendency for humans is to want to be successful. I mean, that's right. the whole. Um, so in that, you have all these videos on YouTube that are conspiracy theory stuff, and they get a lot of traction. Mm -hmm. People like outrageous stuff. Yep. And um, to go to the the moon conspiracy stuff. And by the way, I love conspiracy stuff. Now, doesn't mean that I I can't say, right? I can't say to you that I can call something out for silly and not silly. Mm -hmm. But I like when thought is put behind a thing and you have um, people are testing the bounds of, of, of what is and what is not and stuff. Uh, and so there's this one guy called um, Jake the a hole okay right? but he's got the full name written out mm -hmm. and that's his channel okay you know you know how we're always worried about cursing and whatnot he he has no problem and he's still monetized and it's still go so there's not even a, a, a an even playing field when it comes to any of these things because the top dogs they curse up a storm then you have it's 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 basically a no man's land you know uh, of whatever it's anarchy or, or you get what i'm saying right i do i do i get what you're saying so jake you know he calls the uh lunar module the thing that you know that that sat there that, yeah. that part of it he calls it a a tweaker a tweaker shelter it looks like he says, come on, that thing looks like a tweaker's ch shelter. And he makes shirts mm -hmm. with, the, with the actual landing module. And it, because he's basically saying it's wrapped in aluminum foil. It looks like going down somewhere in LA and it looks like a wrapped, it's just so hilarious. But he does um, put forth the idea and conspiracy that, that we, we did not go, that through space that thin th that thin you know thing sitting out there it's just none of it um uh, the radiation all the stuff and there are things that they put out now me being let's say me i'm curious and i'll watch all those things um i don't know i can't i'm not a scientist to say well, with x amount of radiation um the human body i can't do any of well, that you see and that's why this stuff is done by teams of geniuses and not a bunch of people that dink around on the internet yeah that's what i'm you getting know? at <laughs> well that's yeah. what i'm getting at like i can't i uh, it's interesting well i don't know about medieval i don't have firsthand knowledge about medieval you know or renaissance you know culture and this and that but there sure is a heck of a lot of videos out there of it so humans tend to be curious and this and that well, and, okay and, but you're talking about stuff after the fact and you can go back and read and we find archaeological evidence and things of that nature but i mean just because he's never been to the moon he doesn't believe it you know okay fine yeah, yeah but it, it's not it's not as it's not as so they don't they don't so if that were their argument, then nobody would watch their videos because well, there's, of nothing, there's there's no meat yeah, to it. Of course. And, you know and that's, 
and that's what it is uh, in a lot of cases. And you and I have discussed discussed this kind of thing before. And I know you think conspiracy videos and conspiracy theories are entertaining. Entertaining. Cool. And enter I just think they're kind of sad myself. But that's fine. I mean, that's great. Uh, you know, it, it it's. I I don't know. I I look at it this way: four hundred thousand people were employed either directly or indirectly in that entire program. 400,000 people. How come there's not one behind the scenes photo? I mean, I know we didn't have cell phones and it wasn't that easy to, you know, there was no Instagram and stuff like that. Well, they have, but, they have, they do have a lot of behind the scenes, what they claim as behind the scenes, not only photos, but footage they have a lot okay. of stuff out there who who, who? because so, uh, the way i look at it is this um as bad as the u.s government is about not being honest with its population they're even worse about keeping it a secret and four hundred thousand people somebody would have said something right but and, but you know, you can't unring a bell. The minute one person says something, there'd be three or four others going, yeah, he's absolutely right. And I was there and we did this and that and the other. Yeah, my only well, let me address that. My only problem with that, and it's completely reasonable, I think, um, the issue of 4,000 people keeping a secret, everybody, um, you know it's, it's hard to keep a secret between two people. Yeah. How, however... However, here's the problem with the the backlash of one saying, well, how about how can 400 people keep a secret? Um, the CIA, the Pentagon, many of the, the government agencies mm -hmm. dealing in high level, you know, secret, you know, yeah. documentation programs and all sorts of things mm -hmm. are out of the reach of of everyday human beings um and completely oblivious to you know facts that are going on okay. um even throughout the course of history even to this day mm -hmm. that are, were in the hands of many people because they they also explain people explain that how do you do that you carp you compartmentalize things so mm -hmm. now i'm not making i'm the argument i'm making here is the argument that yes Secrets can be kept depending on what it is, depending on various factors, because you can easily carp, um, compartmentalize right. different tasks. Right. Because you already have a job. Mm -hmm. You know, all I do in my job is serve the function that, like, if it's putting two pieces together and putting it in the conveyor belt and letting it go down the line, all that that employee is doing is working on that specific thing. Right. They don't even have the full. So there is, without, in my opinion, without any, um, I mean, unless one, one explains, I have no doubt that secrets can be, depending on how it's okay. prepared and set up, can be kept because nobody knows the full picture. But how do you know that? You how do know I know that? You, you know that because somebody talked. You know that because that information came out. You know that because somebody made the fact that they're collecting all that information and they're doing these clandestine things came out and said so in public. That's what I'm getting at. And there well, when something when public. something get, when something gets discovered, and how does it get discovered by somebody right. talking? And right. four hundred thousand people. Now let's add in the entire population of Florida who was out there that day, and they saw that thing take off and go up into the sky. You can't compartmentalize a state full of people. Yeah, but wait a second. Um, <laughs> wait a second. Going up in the sky is also, look, going up in the sky mm -hmm. is also, look, I can say without any doubt that the sky is blue. I can actually say that and sound confident that the sky is blue. Right. And, you know, you can, you can, you can argue that it's to go further that the reason it's blue is because X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. I, you can, you can go into a more, 
detailed thing. And what I'm saying is that these conspiracy people, not saying whether they're right, wrong, they're interesting, but they don't stop at, at you know, I saw it go up in the sky. Because right. what they'll say to you is that every photo, every video, every photo of something going up into the sky, never, and there's 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 a counter to that as well, never goes up into the sky, straight up into the sky. It always goes up and then starts to go in towards the side on an angle to the disappear. And they argue that it goes up and it goes away and drops in the ocean or whatnot, or or it, it lands somewhere else if it's a shuttle, or it, it can go around the, the, the world or whatnot. But it never, you never see it going straight up. The argument would be to counter that, just to, you know, is that it does so they can grab on to the rotation and then do the so there's there's all these competing things so that's where conspiracies grab force you know and people come along that are are novice and right. they they can be they can become convinced of a thing i understand that um and now you know why i say that um that's why these kinds of things like going to the moon is figured out by teams of thousands and thousands of geniuses and not a bunch of people hacking around on the internet. You know, I mean, just, <laughs> just yesterday or the day before Steve and I were on hangouts and Jimmy Duresta, we've named him twice on the thing. Any, 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 uh, any shout outs, uh, he built, they took, I think they took a huge blueprint of the actual space capsule, I think it was, yeah. and each maker it was thrown across the the, the yeah. world into the maker community, reconstructed each a part piece. of what made up the thing, and it's a quite, yeah, just his piece was quite the elaborate. He did it out of wood and like aluminum and this and that, but is quite elaborate. So it, it sounds like a it would be a big hoax. You know, like a big freaking with all these things and, and details and, you know, uh, going against like the conspiracy th theories. It sounds like a very elaborate. It would have to be a very elaborate hoax um, that they went to that extreme to create a hoax. And then you would ask for what reason? Yeah. And, then, and that's my next question. To what end? To what end? I mean, why? Why would you fake that? Why? What's the purpose? I mean, I can't think of a logical reason. I mean, and and I can. I, yeah, I, I've since I can. about 1975, 76, 77, I've heard the arguments and this, that, and the other. You know, the one that I like the most is, uh, well, that one picture of Buzz Aldrin on the moon supposedly taken by Neil Armstrong. You see the reflection of Neil Armstrong in his helmet in the visor, and he's not holding a camera. It's like, what do you think he was up there with a Polaroid? You think he got a camera out and held it up here in front of his eye and said, smile? No. Look at his hands. There's a little pack on his chest. Blow up the picture of Buzz Aldrin. The camera's mounted on his chest. And when you look at Neil Armstrong, he's got one hand up like this and the other hand down below, pushing a button. That's where the camera is. And you blow up that picture of Buzz Aldrin and you see the lens. No, they didn't go up there with those big fat gloves and take a picture like that and then wind the film and take another one. That's why I say these things were invented by teams of geniuses, not a bunch of guys hacking around on the Internet. <laughs> so <laughs> I love that. That's one of my favorite ones. Well, um, I, so I think that um, I've mentioned this before that I suspect that they actually filmed pickup stuff on Earth in order to, because look, they didn't know that. I mean, what would have, what would that have what would have happened? Um, like what happened with the Challenger? What would have happened if they would have done this? Sent people, and that kind of thing would have happened, where they didn't come back, they were lost in space, or some sort of crazy thing. I mean, that would have been a terrible. Uh, from what I gather, um, and this didn't come out for a few years, but uh, Richard Nixon was president at the time. And he, there were actually two speeches written. And if you search on the Internet, you'll find a copy of this speech. He had a speech that he read that was congratulating them 
for the landing and the successful return. Yeah. He also had another one written just in case they couldn't get back. Right. And you can find that speech online now if you search for it. Yeah. Um, and it was, it's pretty, it's pretty bleak, but pretty, you know, it, it, it'll, it'll tug at you a little bit if you have a, any kind of feeling at all. You know, when you stop and think about some people who are just basically going to live for as long as they have oxygen up there and that's it. Um, the possibility was always there. I, I don't remember which one of the astronauts said it. But he said, nothing gets your hearts racing faster than sitting in a space capsule at, on the launch pad, realizing that you are sitting on top of millions of pounds of highly volatile rocket fuel that was designed and built by the lowest bidder. <laughs> he said, that will get your heart racing. That'll get the blood pumping. It's like, geez, I hope everything goes okay. Well, not because only that. They did have several. They did have several explosions. They did have several astronauts. I mean, uh, there were three astronauts killed on a fire, killed in a fire on the launch pad. Uh, I don't rem I know. I know Gus Grissom was one of them, but I don't remember the names of the others. And that's that's bad on me. I should remember the names of the others. Not, not, not only that, the actual going up and landing, not knowing what the surface was actually going to be like. I mean, it could land, but mm -hmm. what if it was like, I mean, they thought these things as well. If you read back, they had worries that when it landed, not only the fact of it landing proper um, so that it touches down, even instead of a crash, but they also had the worry that wherever it landed would just sink in to some sort of like, you know, lunar dust that sucks them in. Who knows what they did not know. They had sus suspicions of, oh, it, it should be this, but they weren't sure that it would even survive to land, you know, and if it did land, that it would not get sucked in. I mean, they went basically with the idea i mean i don't know what percentage that you're not coming back there's no way that you could you know confidently say yeah we're going to the moon when they've never done it before and not have a suspect sort of feeling in the gut of possible you know bad right. bad results it, right. it's it's such it's a big feat that they well, that they accomplished you know and every single one of them were braver than I'll ever be, you know, and God bless them all. Those that returned and those who didn't. But, and by the way, um, that was Apollo 1 in 1967. And that was uh, Gus Grissom. Uh, the senior pilot was Ed White. And the pilot was Roger Chafee. And uh, it was a flash fire that went through the cabin uh, during a launch rehearsal test. And it was just pure oxygen cabin atmosphere. And um, it they just, it was an electrical fire and they just didn't have a chance. They had no chance at all. But um, uh, yeah, they had absolutely no idea what they were going to find up there. They had, they had no clue. And that's what I mean when I say these guys were braver than I'll ever be. And that they were willing to not only take the risk, they were excited about taking the risk. They really genuinely wanted to go. And that takes more brass than, you know, I'll ever have. Well, it's like you're, you're basically, you know, just saying, hey, we're going to go do this. And hey, what happens, happens. Let's go. But, but now, but let's think about that for just a minute. If the stars all lined up just right and everything was perfect in the world and they came to you and said, Eloy, we need somebody, would you go to the moon? Nope. I'd go in a minute. Nope, I would not go. I, I don't even want to get on the the, <laughs> the fair rides. I'd go in an instant. I would go in a heartbeat. And I'm a guy that don't like to fly anymore. No, yeah. dude, there's no point in doing that. Wait, look. I you're a human being. You belong yeah. on human human being like territory, which is the look. I am happy with mm -hmm. the soil beneath our feet. 
I'm mm -hmm. happy with the actual air and the, my hands. If I, yeah. you know, move my hands, I can feel you're, the air pushing. You're not through. even the least bit curious. Zero. I, look, I love I, the idea of sending like satellites up and let them explore, go to Mars, travel, let's see reflection, you know, like radio signals back, whatever. I don't want to physically go to it. To me, there's something unnatural about going. I feel that this is our home. I love the earth, the ground, the air, the sunlight, as long as it's, you know, outside of our atmosphere. Um, all the stuff that we, I love earth. I, I do too. I'm with you 100%. But if given the opportunity, I would go in a hot second. I would be, uh, I man, I would be there so fast. Um, my great, great, great grandkids would be born dizzy. See, but I, I, would be, I would move that I, just for the sheer, what is it like? Just no, for the experience. It freaks me out to think that you're going to be out there and let's say you land on a, <coughs> dude, you have to not only go, but get back. And, yeah. and the idea of going and you're in space and too, that's to me, I don't like the idea. I like the earth. I don't care. I, okay. I prefer, I yeah, prefer. Pavement. No, it just, it's shocking to me that you would say, say that. Oh, because dude, are you kidding? I would go in an instant. I've flown all over the ding dong place. And the highest I ever got was 37,000 feet in a commercial airliner going to Germany. I, didn't like I would love I would love to go. Yeah, I'd be there in a minute. I hate the takeoff and the landing. When you take off, it's like, and it's going up. And then your whole, you're feeling like, well, why am, it's like weird on the, on the brain. And then once you're flying, like you're okay. But it's like that takeoff. No, dude, no thank you. <laughs> no thank I got you. Some, I got some army stories to tell you about flying in helicopters that would curl your hair then. <laughs> we'll get into that one day. Oh, man. That's some fun stuff. That's very fun stuff. So, you, oh, go ahead. You, you haven't lived until you've been in the front seat of a Cobra attack helicopter flying below treetop level. Oh, wow. Flying under flying under bridges and stuff like that it's oh my god at 200 knots or well not 200 about 160. well you're clear you're you're, you're aware you're aware that your the helicopter blades are going to clear the pillars right of the bridge the, the pilot is i was not the pilot i was the dude in the front seat hoping that pilot knew what he was doing but i figure you know that's why they're paid the big money and it was an absolute blast would i do it again nah I've done it, but I wanted the experience. It's like, um, you know, look, there's some crazy things out there. I, I can tell you now that I'm quite settled <laughs> to be like not doing crazy. I'm, so, I'll, I'll do a hike. I'll do, you know, I'll, I'll journey. And, and by the way, vehicles are very dangerous. Like automobiles are very dangerous, actually. Sure. So you know the fear factor of it, but we're so accustomed to. If I was brought up on helicopters, I'd probably be like, yeah, but you know, I, I was in my 20s. So, you know, I was young and stupid, but uh, I was still married and had an obliga family obligations. But, you know, you take your life in your hands every time you get in your car, you know, and it's funny. We will get in our car and drive around and not think, a, not give it a second thought. And we're relying on the technology created by the engineers who designed the car. We're relying on them to know their jobs. And we're relying on the people on the assembly line to do their jobs well, even if they came in hung over that morning or they're having a bad day or they're, you know, got to go home early because they're half sick. We're still relying on them to do their jobs. We get into their vehicles and drive every day and don't think, give it a second thought. I know, but... I, and so when geniuses put a spacecraft together, if it ever came down to where they were digging so low under the barrel, gotten below the bottom of the barrel to get to me, I'd go in an instant. I Heck yeah. Hook me up to whatever monitor you need to do to check my blood pressure, my heart rate, and all that other good stuff. Be prepared for a few needles to peg because it's going to scare the crap out of me when we take off. But that's half of the fun. Yeah. Well, no thank you on my, on my end. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you what's more. I would agree to it. But not in the conditions that you're talking about with needles and this and that. Screw that. I want it when we're advanced enough where we could sit com comfortably 
and we can't tell that we're flying and it's like Star Trek, then I'll say, okay, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you this question. Okay. Since you're, you're the bold one here. What if, would you go into one of those uh, Star Trek, you know how they, I don't, I forget what they call. Where, oh, the transporter thing? Yeah. Would you allow a machine to re deconstruct and reconstruct your cells and body? Well, okay. Uh, maybe I'm a little bit adventurous, but I'm not an idiot. I wouldn't be the first one to try it. But, oh, right. if the, but if the technology was developed and it was as commonplace as space travel is now, yeah, I'd do it. Sure. Why not? Um, you know, if it was, if the technology had been perfected and it was as commonplace as all the other technology we have and thousands of people are doing it every day. Sure. I would. Why not? No, dude, not me. Cause I don't see, here's the thing about that. I, I don't want to throw a curveball into this thing, but I believe that we are, are, are creatures created and that we're made up and and this is our soul this is our body our soul our mind and a machine i don't care if i sound like an ancient like you know like <laughs> caveman i don't care a machine that'll decompose all that or break it down into little subatomic whatever and then reconstruct it at the at uh, at the surface of a planet or whatnot sounds not only like witchcraft scientific witchcraft but it sounds like soul eating yeah, I, I, I'm as bad as remember when the native, the the, the American Indian, you, you couldn't take a picture because it would suck the. They believe that it would take. The, <laughs> I'm on there. I'm with them on that. Well, you know, like I said, I wouldn't be the first guy to try it. I would, you know, I would be the. I mean, because we have never, and I don't know that we ever will you know, be able to dissect those building blocks and put them back together again. But again, that's why this stuff is done by teams of geniuses and not guys like you and me, you know? I mean, I don't understand. I don't know that anybody really understands the basic building blocks of life and how to create it, let alone take it apart and put it back together again. When they can do that, oh, I've got forget, that. forget a subatomic level. No, I've when, got they that do, when they can do that with even a fish today, you know, I'll, I'll believe it, you know, Mark, Mark, see, I can, I can, I can, I can, I can do that. Like, and just type it on YouTube and there's, there's a, there's an instructional how to do it on, on YouTube to create a uh, subatomic. Uh, okay. Well, when's that video coming out, Eloy? Are you about done with the uh, post pro post production or. <laughs> dude, dude, I, I, you know, to confirm what you just said, it, I I made this thing and I thought that that boy this was an adventure to make. So imagine creating actual atomic or subatomic <laughs> little things. Yeah, I like, mean you know, but like I say, I mean it, if if the technology was as made it to where it was as commonplace as getting in your car is today, sure I'd do it. Why not? I'd, yeah. I'd give it a shot. You know, I'm not stupid. I'm not a thrill seeker. You know, I've never been bungee jumping. I've never uh, been skydiving. I believe it's foolish to jump out of a perfectly good aircraft on purpose. Now, don't get me wrong. If the pilot's jumping, I'm either right in front of him or right behind him. One of the two. But so long as he's up there doing what he's doing, I'm his biggest cheerleader, man. And I don't feel the need to get out and walk. Oh, but, I'm with you. You know, but, you know, roller coasters, I'm okay with. Well, I was okay with. I may be too old for them now. <laughs> and um, that's a hard thing to admit. But what can you say? I don't, you know, that kind of stuff doesn't, you know, I'm perfectly okay not spinning around and loop the loop. And I don't want, I don't, I don't find it entertaining. I don't find it useful. I, it makes me queasy. I'd rather walk the, the fairway and, and and purchase like you know food and and onion rings and whatnot well, and look that, at you do that after the roller coasters see oh boy talk about going you, over you, to yeah, one of yeah, the trash cans and puking yeah, don't do it before the roller coaster do it after the roller coaster oh, dude know? man it's too much it's it's too much i can't do it <laughs> you know I, I just it's too much I, i'm not gonna i love the fair but i don't i'm not into the spinny spin rides it's just too much for me you know um i just I get motion sickness too fast, to be honest with you. So I, I wouldn't be able to do the astronaut thing either. I've only got, well, don't, don't feel like the Lone Ranger there because believe me, 
the, even on the International Space Station, they all get motion sickness, every single one of them. And they'll, every one of them will admit it to you too. So much so that they have, <laughs> they've come up with uh, what they call the Garn scale. Years, a few years ago, uh, John Glenn and another older, Jake Garn was his name. And he was an, I don't think he was an astronaut previously. He may have been a fighter pilot, but he may have been an astronaut, and I just don't remember that part. But his name was Jake Garn, and they went up into space. And John Glenn became the oldest man ever to go into space. He was in his 70s, I want to say. And Garn was just so incapacitated with nausea that that's about all he did the, his entire time in space was get sick. That's and horrible. they came up with the Garn scale of how sick are you? And the level one is completely and totally incapacitated. And that was him. <laughs> so he was totally like, he couldn't even, he couldn't do a ding dong thing. He was sick the whole time. So, um, so that's very common. And in fact, the number one medication they send up there that they have up there on the International Space Station is motion sickness medication. Because a lot of people have a misconception. They say when you're up out in space, there's no gravity. You're in zero gravity. There's tons of gravity up there. There's gravity all over the place. Gravity is what keeps the moon where it is. Gravity is what keeps the earth where it is in relation to the sun and the moon and the other planets. There's gravity everywhere. You're in weightlessness. You're basically in free fall. It is a case of like the International Space Station. It's falling towards the earth and keeps missing because the earth's moving. And the gravity keeps, thro keeps throwing it back around. You're in free fall. You're weightless. There's gravity all over the place. You, it just doesn't work on you. So they feel like they're constantly falling? Right. They feel like they're constantly moving because they are constantly moving. Yeah, that sucks. I can't, you, I can't fall asleep like that. And when you figure they're going around the world every one hour and 40 minutes, 30, one hour 30 to one hour and 40 minutes, at about 17,000 miles an hour, they're moving pretty fast. Yeah, I can't, I can't forget that, you know, I need to be stabilized to eat and for, you know, I can't feel like I'm jumping out of a, constantly jumping out of a plane and, and concentrate on, you know, you have to be a special person to be able to do yeah, no what doubt. you do. No doubt. There's no, no doubt. way. And that's why they train for two, three years before they'll, two, three, four years before they ever get on a, a rocket to go up. But. Yeah, so I, I just find that interesting. I thought you were a little bit more adventurous than that. I thought that you were at least you, curious about it. I, I think you miscalculated me. <laughs> I did, big time. <laughs> I'm, I have no problem. Look, I have no problem, you know, what, playing a song, guitar on Earth. It's all Earth activities. Uh, doing a podcast on Earth. Uh, doing a YouTube video on Earth. No problem. Add the space and the motion and this and that. I don't want that. Who yeah, wants that? Not me. Look, look how famous. Lots of people want it. Look how famous Chris Hadfield got when he did Space Oddity up on the International Space Station. Yeah, but um, I'm not looking for that. Oh, okay. Forget that. Forget that. I mean, forget. I'd rather go in the ocean than that. And mind you, it has to be Atlantic Ocean. Where's, you know, I'm quite of this earth. <laughs> it, you know, and it depends as far as the ocean is concerned. It depends on where you're going and what you're doing as to whether I'll go for that, too, because I don't think there's giant sharks up in space that are ready to, you know, prove I'm not on the top of the food chain. I know they are in the ocean. So if I'm in like a submersible or something like that, you know, OK, we'll talk. Um, but if you're talking about putting on your fins and a snorkel and let's go. Nah, let's go do that in the lake. Well, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm totally. If they dropped our butts off in the Antarctica on a raft, you know that's as dangerous as anything. Alone, you're stuck in the middle of nowhere. You're not going anywhere. You're gonna. I mean, that's not a good situation. So, um, there's 
inhospitable places on this planet that we need backup. So sure. at least we're on this planet. Sure. And that's, you know, you're talking about getting adventurous. There is one ribbon with a badge that I, uh, for some reason, it always intrigued the heck out of me. And I always wanted to earn that ribbon for my army uniform. And I never would have had the chance to get it. And that's probably one reason why I wanted it so bad. And that was the Antarctica service ribbon with the wintered over badge. I wanted to winter over in Antarctica. Oh, wow. Don't ask me why. I'm not a researcher. I'm not a scientist. I'd like to go to Antarctica just to see it. To this and, day? Yeah, to this day. And I know you can go to New Zealand and you can take uh, you can take a, a, a boat out of Christchurch and go down and you can land it on Antarctica and they do tours and things like that and then go back. Um, but I'd like to do that just to say that I've been there, just to see it, to experience it. Well, I mean, so I don't want to overplay, you know, because, you know, there's always the there's always the, the duo and one has to play the, the straight guy and the other one, the, 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 the comedian or whatnot. But I, I just have to tell you that instead of risking your butt, like I told Brian Bales, because Brian Bales, for those of you guys who don't know, went all the way to uh, Morocco and it you know was quite the adventure. Um, and he went to Egypt, didn't he? Uh, to Egypt, yeah. Um, he went to Egypt to the pyramids and, and all that. Um, well, you know, you're when you leave, it's like Frodo Frodo Baggins or whatever, Bilbo mm -hmm. Baggins. Mm -hmm. um, you never know what it, when you leave your door. You know, you never know what's going to happen when you when you walk out your door. It's 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 a wild wild wor world. So I suggest to you, you can look at the penguins on YouTube and have have at it. Ah man, you know that's. I just think that would be cool. You know. I, I just think it would be cool to see. Uh, I, I've always been that way. When my wife and I met and married at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And six, eight months later, no, six months later, we got shipped to Germany. And the only things we shipped besides our clothes, the only household goods we shipped were my stepdaughter's bed and 850 pounds of books. That's all we owned. We, we had a few pots and pans we got at garage sales and, and flea markets, but we had no furniture of our own. The place we lived in was furnished. And when we got over to Germany, we decided, look, we can either buy stuff or we can buy memories. People save up their entire lives to spend two weeks in Europe, and we're basically being paid to, be to there. live there for three years. So that's what we did. We, we traveled. We, you know, uh, Paris was a five-hour drive. We went to Paris. We went to Holland. We went to uh, uh, Belgium. We went to uh, Austria, Switzerland. I mean, we went all over the place. When the Berlin Wall came down, we drove off the map into the former East Germany and found some cool little towns that just, it looked like time stopped in 1947, you know? And so I've always been adventurous like that. I, you know, I'd like to go to Asia. I'd like to go to two places I've always wanted to go were well three places australia new zealand and tahiti for some reason don't know why i want to go to tahiti if you want to go to tahiti i don't mean to cut you off but you should see the truman show the truman show yes i think you that, have that, to you know what i think that started this entire podcast experience <laughs> really because he wanted to go to tahiti so bad he was like tahiti i gotta go to tahiti you, you have to watch that movie we want to know your reaction to that movie well, it's been almost a year. Maybe I'll do that for our one one year anniversary show. I'll actually watch it and give you my thoughts. You might I think be... we talked about that. I think we talked about that in episode. Did we talk about that in episode one, or was that like episode three or four? Boy, I don't. You know, you could go back to the Wayback Machine on our website and go down the list because we have all of our past episodes there, um, which is trampledunderfootpodcast.com. dot com. That's right. Check the Wayback Machine, big link right in the center. You can't miss it. You can go back and check all those episodes. And in fact, when we get done here, I'm going to. And I have to find that video that I mentioned earlier as well for you guys that um, that haven't that didn't hear that bit. It's a great video, on, and the guy explains how um, he's looking at YouTube as far as algorithms, this, this, and that. And it's very well 
done. I found it well done. It's a long video, though. It's about 20 minutes, but he does a real good job of explaining um, how it is that channels chase the algorithm, the algorithm chases the audience, and it's all just, you know, for not. You can't know a thing. So um, while Mark is typing, I'm trying to fill in the blanks here. <laughs> Sorry about that. I got asked a question in the chat, and I had to answer. So, this will be edited out, which obviously, because it's my edit this week, means it won't be. Actually, it's is it your edit or my edit? Mm, I think it's mine, but we'll get into that later on. <laughs> so um, I do want to say one other thing. Um, I came across the video talking about my mysteries and life, and it, although it's not a conspiracy theory necessarily, but science has a name, you know, a, a, a sort of a, attached to science is our people that are quite in the know. And rightly so, you're studying and you're examining a thing to find out how it works, how it functions. With, But there's also the horrible addition of human arrogance when it comes to knowledge and it becomes like a, a hierarchy thing, um, a, a, a very arrogant thing in people. And when it comes to things like life, um, I always take, and I guess it's my decision to do so because it's just where I, like, I don't know the origins of life because I think that that's quite the only, re the only reasonable thing I could say. I don't know. To me is the most reasonable thing. But, you know, People come around, oh, yeah, the thing is, uh, it took, you know, millions upon millions and then cells got together and formed, you know, the first simple organisms and this and this. And I also posted a video um, last week or maybe this week. I, I don't remember exactly, but it was like this this um, Nobel, Nobel Prize winning and he was in a group. So that that won the Nobel Prize, um, scientist um, mm -hmm. that studies cells and this and that, and he proceeded to in this video explain why it is just total savagery. To people have tried, scientists have tried to create a simple functioning cell, right? A simple functioning, and they can't do it because the right. amount of even in the simplest. Uh, cell, you know, there is so much DNA, it's like it just, it gets overwhelming and overwhelming and he just said that the, the more we we learn about the cell the further we are from knowing anything like, right. like the less we know because right. it becomes even more complicated mm -hmm. and so it would be sheer ar arrogance in my opinion, oh yeah, because I read it in this textbook as a layman because you read a book even in this respect Oh, yeah, because you see the function, the reason life and the Big Bang and this and that, these are all theoretical assumptions, this and that, but there's nothing. We know nothing. Right. And and, and the reason I'm mentioning this, since we're talking about the stars and, and you know, the moon and, and just these big topics, is that um, we, we are, what we know, uh, which seems like a lot, is has to be I, I don't know a drop in the in the bucket uh, of the universe of yep. knowledge um and I am totally open to possibilities I do not think that um I think it's very very it's impossible to think of how the heck we got to the point where I'm sitting here talking to you and you have consciousness and you're signaling back to me with information verbally and we're communicating, and there's abstract thoughts, but we're also doing it over a machine that sends information information out um, where we can see each other from different locations on this thing that we call Earth. Just it gets more and more complicated, and this is just on a level of things that we, mankind has been able to put together. I just think that this whole journey of life is so fantastical. It is. It's, you know, I mean, I can't disagree with a single th or even debate a single thing that you said. And by the way, I watched that video as well. Oh, okay. And the man is 
well, to say he's a genius is just restating the obvious. He wouldn't have been a part of a Nobel Prize winning team if he wasn't. But when having never really thought about the topic before, listening to what he had to say about the topic, and when you think about how complex the even a single cell is, because it's, as he says, it's more than just DNA. There are so many things you have to get together and put together correctly before you even get to thinking about DNA. You know, just even the a thin membrane, they've never been able to do it. They don't know how. You know, they, they just simply do not know how. And they think they do. And you're absolutely right. Human arrogance arrogance enters into it. And somebody will propose a hypothesis and use that as the basis of a theory. And then without any kind of a supporting evidence or what have you, it just becomes, oh, well, that's established fact. Well, they've yeah. proven it. Well, who is they? You know, again, who is they? He did mention that one would have to take a leap of actual literal faith, and he called out scientists on it because he said that that they take things at, at face value as is, you know, and it's sort of become uh, um, an acceptable, you know, feel that, oh, okay, so out of the Big Bang um, uh, cells and all these minerals or amino acids and chemicals got together and decided to... Um, proceed into something more complicated because it was you know it was in their best interest but see that's the thing he also says there's no information in the that in those tiny specks of mineral or um, amino acids or whatever to even know how to go forward or backwards or anything that's right. not there that information is not there these are just and so scientists in a petri dish have tried to connect these things and they've gathered enough to form a thing that just dissolved yeah um yeah they're trying and, to stick things together that creates simple cells and it just dissolves and the thing that got me about it was when he talks about well this happened this was evolution over the course of millions of years he's like time is your enemy all things degrade yeah all things degrade so you know you can't say that it, it was the benefit of time that did this. In other words, his, his whole thing was, we just don't know. And anybody that says they know is full of it. They just don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm honestly, we only get as far as we know, one shot at this existence. As far as we know, we don't know. Right. Yeah, exactly. And we know that we're living it now, all of us here. Mm -hmm. And I can't always, obviously, we can't function on that level because we go crazy. You can't be thinking about that all the time. But when it pops up into your head, you're like, holy smokes. And yeah. see, and with that thought, to know that we're, we're not limitless, as far as we know, that we have a certain time. I mean, hell, we've been doing ancestry. We know all the people that have come before us. They started mm -hmm. and ended. And then here we are. You can't help but understand like at least my conclusion is that you know um boy it's time is so short we have such awesome questions we can't do anything about it i can't help but think to myself you know um this is something very special um that we that we have you know i i, I don't know how do how does one even work that into their heads you know you have to you have to know that exists, but you have to go on with your daily life, whatever that means. Because what does that mean? What yeah. does it matter that my microphone is a Samson, this, this, and that, or not? Or I mean, just a lot of things start to, but you can't function on that. So you have to sort of accept yeah. a common reality. But in, rea right. in reality, it's what you make it. Yep. It's just and a weird thing. And again, human ego and human arrogance gets into it because I'm not satisfied with the microphone I have. I have to get a better one. And I say this is a guy who's working on a cheap $30 headset. So <laughs> <laughs> I feel qualified to make that statement because you, the listener, suffer because I'm cheap. <laughs> one other thing going in a side 
uh, route. I was talking to Steve the other day. Um, and so he, I told him, oh, dude, I saw this awesome video on on Knights. And Knights coincided. Did you know that Knights existed for 200 years, roughly, and then they were done with? I, I For some reason, I thought it was longer than that, but okay. So, well, here's the thing. I thought so, too, but apparently, like, what we recognize as Knights and this and that, I guess we'll have to do some research, but according to this very well-made, I mean, when I mean very well-made documentary, I mean very well-made documentary, they could be pulling our legs, because I also thought the same thing, but they started and ended around the time that firearms were in use in Europe, like the yeah. very old shot. Knights were around at the end of it mm -hmm. when actual projectiles that were with black powder mm -hmm. were being used. And the whole document documentary was about some armors. They had this armor uh, from uh, this British noble. Mm -hmm. um, it was meant to even protect. Was Could they protect against gunfire? Right. They had common armor and then they had advanced armor or you know, specialized for the um, whatever, the noble people. Sure. Uh, and they did a whole thing where they tested one of those projectiles on the common guard uh, armor and it pelted right through the metal and sure. it just right through into slow motion, all that. And then they tried it. They built their own armor out of nothing like they would have done from back in the day. Um, and they tested it. And bam, it hits it, right? And then the guy comes up and stuff, and they look. It dented it. The projectile exploded into fragments in slow motion. You could see it. It only dented it, and when you pulled it around the... It had two layers. Um, there was no there was no injury. So you could have survived um, from these projectiles uh, at, at the very end of the whole, you know, medieval knights or knights uh, mm -hmm. era. And I found it very interesting. But now, oh, go ahead, go ahead. The weapon they were using was it uh, was it uh, a black powder, uh, lead ball type of a rifle that they would have had back then, or one of their? Yeah, it was like it looked like a wooden, or like I, I'm not sure, like some sort of long round metal thing with a handle, but yeah. it wasn't even a gun. Like it just looked like a little handheld cannon. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then it had like a little wick, and they'd light it, and then you'd, you'd blow on the wick. It would flare up with with heat, and then when you triggered it, it would, it would, it would snap. Okay, match, and, uh, yeah. Okay. Match lock. Yeah. Well, no, it, was, it wasn't even a match lock. But, but okay. I told Steve about what I'd seen. He says, "Oh, there's this other channel where the guy does all sorts of medieval cooking, and what would have the peasants had for food? What would?" you know, the um, the better to do middle class and what would the, the royalty and all that. And he goes to a lady that I guess is an expert on that. And they actually, she prepares all the foods along the way and shows it's such an awesome series, dude. Um, just fascinating, dude. Um, and they didn't eat. Apparently, whatever they did have wasn't that bad. Yeah. They had bread. They drank beer. I was like, hey, that's two yeah. pluses right there. And your meat was usually some salmon caught from the stream because it wasn't even considered a fancy food. Um, the big dogs used to eat rabbit mm -hmm. and all sorts of you know poultry, this and that. But the small guys wouldn't eat poultry because if you killed your chicken, you had no more eggs. They right. would wait till the end, till the chicken was all like crusty, and then they'd eat the darn thing. Yeah, and series. like the deer and the pheasant and things like that, they all belong to the laird. And if you were caught poaching a deer, that was death for you. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. How we got on that, I don't know. But that's what we do here on Trampled Underfoot. I just, we, I was trying to go away from, because we went see, into the... That, that should be our slogan. Trampled Underfoot, we digress. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Trampled Underfoot. How the heck we get over here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> True. But yeah, I mean, you know, it, uh, and believe it or not, I've seen that. What did pe medieval peasants eat? I've seen that come up in my suggested. I've just not clicked on it. Right. And I've seen that video with the reservoir with all the black balls. I've just yeah. never clicked it either. I've seen that suggested to me too. 
Yeah, I wasn't big on on the whole video of the black balls in the re reservoir, but that's the one that got him like popularity. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's mentioned so much in this episode of Trampled yeah. Underfoot. But his okay. his after video where he breaks down all these things, I, I I as a video guy and this and that, I enjoyed it. Okay. Okay. That was about it then, man. That was all I had to talk about. But we went all over the place. We literally went around the world from Antarctica to the moon, back and then into medieval history. You know, it's hard to, when we talk about like the moon part, because I, I do watch all these these videos that are conspiracy theories, this and that. Mm -hmm. And I watch it in a way where it's like, how can I say, I'm, I'm consuming information and I'm making assumptions, listening to it, and this and that. Oh, that sounds. Comp I don't know. I can't answer that. I always end up saying, "Well, I I can't I can't agree to it," but I'm not going to shrug it off. It's interesting. But the problem with talking about these things and bringing these things up is that one one could easily get labeled into the category of like yeah. one is suspect of everything, which is one issue. But I think most people, if you accept. If you don't insult people's intelligence um, and allow for, I think you could you could stretch the bounds of of what you say out there, um, even if it doesn't sound reasonable. Let's say, um, or in the norm, the common thing. I, I think people see it for what it is, but well, it's I a think concern. It's, I think it's perfectly normal for people to question. I really do. I think it's perfectly normal, and I think it's perfectly acceptable to question. But it, as you said earlier, when you get off into silliness, it's just, I mean, you know, when you got people saying that Australia is fake, you know, I mean, come on. Like the, the actual just, continent? On. Yes, the continent is fake. Australia in, is fake. There's no such thing. But what's their, how do they, but you can, I, you know, I never even looked. Ah, but see, that's where I come in to say to you. If you're ready to say, because hey, it's silliness. But what if, what if, I mean, when I was a kid, look, in the cartoons, you would uh, see Bugs Bunny digging down, and yeah. then he's digging, and you're a little kid and you're watching Bugs Bunny digging down, and then he pops up, and the screen, remember, would turn around, and he's in China. <laughs> Do you remember? Yeah. You know, um, so I guess that's neither here nor there. It's just that the, it, it, it's, it's okay to, to allow this australia thing and see what they have to offer just on sheer fun i mean if they bust out with something that, that you're like what i mean maybe it's maybe it's something worth you know who knows it sounds stupid but hey well that's that's my first point clue right there it sounds stupid are you you're telling, gonna tell me a whole continent is fake are you telling okay, me professor no, plum wait google it Oh, no, I'm going to YouTube it right now. So what, mm -hmm. what should I say? I should say Australia, Australia is fake. <laughs> You'll get a result. And there, ladies and gentlemen, goes his evening. It, tur <laughs> it turns out, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it here first, or maybe you've heard it before. Holy smokes. Um, it turns out Australia is fake. Australia is a lie. These are the different... Is your honey real honey or just sugar syrup? I don't know how that got in there. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's Australian bees. That's what it is. I can't believe. And oh, how did fake too? Fake f Australia is fake. The conspiracy in quotes. Oh gosh, um, Mark, how did this get on your? I don't get one single conspiracy theory on my freaking trendings thing. How'd you get that on your trendings thing? It didn't come to me. It didn't come on my trendings thing. I saw it in a Facebook post. Oh, somebody okay. was somebody was posting. Somebody brought up something. I don't remember what subject it was. And somebody else said, oh, yeah, you think that's funny. Check this out. And that's what the video was. And I looked at it and I went, the whole continent is fake. Yeah, okay. Well, whatever floats your boat there, Lukey. <laughs> Go right on ahead. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'm gonna I'm not gonna sit here and lie. I'm gonna actually watch that video. Did I call it or did I call it? There goes your evening. Because you're gonna go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> Look, I don't know. It, folks, YouTube is dangerous. It's dangerous. Stay here, 
Watch us. We'll keep you safe. You're only going to be with us for an hour, maybe a little bit more. But if you hit that suggested side over there to the right, oh, man, six hours from now, you're going to be sitting there watching uh, some 45-minute doc documentary about giraffes going, what the hell have I done with my life? Oh, man. Be careful. <laughs> I, be careful. I, I don't want to get, get in. I think we've we've done well, and we sh we do well to, to, to end it now and say our goodbyes. But I, 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 saw, I just thought of something so crazy, uh -oh. dude. Um, I, I guess I'm going to share it, and it's very brief. Do you remember that video? I don't know when they recorded it, but it was a Frenchman. I believe it was a Frenchman. Could be from Quebec. I don't know. He traveled somewhere to either Papua New Guinea or something, and he encountered a tribe that had never seen white man before in their lives. Did you ever see that? I saw a similar video. Oh, boy, this has been three or four years back. A uh, guy had a camera running and came across, and I don't remember where it was, uh, supposedly uh, a group of people who had never seen, they thought were, they were the only people on Earth. Yeah. And never made contact with any other human beings before, let alone white people. But uh, I, I don't know the specific video you're talking about. Oh, man, it's fascinating um, because <clears throat> these group of people in the jungle – you know, the European people come in and they have supplies and whatnot because these people have have been ravaged by all sorts of, you know, diseases that we can normally control. And um, they come in contact and you see the tribesmen coming up, crossing a log across the river and they just get close, but they get close and they run away because they look at the white man and they run away. And then th finally they get the white man has his palms out and is trying to like you know, make himself as, uh, as, you know, unimposing as possible. And finally he comes up to him and he touches his hand. Like the white man reaches out and the, the tribesman just like touches his, his little tips of his finger and draws his arm back as if there was a magic shock between them. <laughs> you know, and he's like, he's not wanting to touch his hand, but the, finally they touch. And at, after like some hours, He's rubbing the guy's skin. I mean, all they needed was some some oil, and they could have some. <laughs> but they were they were rubbing their hair and everything, and they were like amazed. You know, uh, great video, but I I'll leave it at that. Uh, just the minute you said they come across this river on a log, that's the video I saw. Okay, yeah. So I did see that video, and they were scared to death. Yeah. How real it was, I don't know. What? I, I don't know. Oh, oh, I'm oh, wait, 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 wait. Don't you even try that with me, homeboy. You just questioned everything about the moon. Now, <laughs> I question a video about some people who have never seen white folk in their life. And you go, what? What? <laughs> <laughs> no, but isn't it funny how that works, though? What uh, yeah, you, it's what, hilarious. What you, isn't, it, <laughs> isn't it funny how that works, though, right? I'm telling you, like, the moon landing, what? You know, and then now, that's an awesome observation, Mark. How dare I? <laughs> and the, main reason I say, the main reason I say that is because it's been done in the past. Well, I know that. But wait a second. See, <laughs> see, you know, we don't get to pick what we get to be conspiracy theorists on, but I, I, oh, I mean, I guess, no, come on now. <laughs> well, I guess we do. I guess we do. But wait a second. How, why would you question? Did you not find the, the scared look on their face? They would have, okay, look, if this is, if that video is fake about the, you know, encounter. And when I mean encounter, I don't mean close encounters from space. I'm talking about the, this Aborigines, you know, encountering Europeans. Would you not give them like five Academy Awards? Because man, oh, yeah, it was convincing. Don't get me wrong; it was convincing. But I have to admit that I that I came away from that video going, I really don't know if this is real or not, and that's sad. I was kind of saddened by it, by that thought popping into my brain. I just hope that this one, you know, I'm, I I wonder if this one is real, and mainly that's because it's been done before. 
and it turns out it was all a bunch of BS. Okay. You know? Well, I mean, but it, it, it wouldn't it be sad if it turns out this one was fake too? You know, I don't know, and that's my cynical brain at work. Yeah, I love how it's it's. I can't get you to you know with to question at least one little thing with the whole space thing, but you're all in when it comes to like discovering new tribes that have never. No, you know, I'm like, not all no. in. Like I said, I and like I said, I hope this one isn't fake, like the other ones have been. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, so. I, I have to, I have to in, in uh, what do you, what's the word embellish. Because we are doing it, but I, I, I totally understand. I, I get it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> hey, folks, you know this is what this is what we do. But um, I think it's time for us to go uh, bye bye. Yep, I think we hit it. I think we got it covered. But do us a favor: stop off over on our Facebook page, Trampled Underfoot Podcast on Facebook. Um, I've already forgotten what I'm going to put a link up to. Oh, yeah, I'm going to put a link to uh, Hellenites over there on our Trampled Underfoot podcast Facebook page. Uh, so you can uh, check out uh, Ryan Bitters and Eloy Escajedo and their discussion about morphing from 80s to 90s. All the good, all the bad, all the indifferent. And uh, you were going to put a link over there as well. Yeah, I'm going to put a link for the YouTube thing. I th I think it's a great. I've already made stated my my, my little uh, points there. Um, I'll link that too. It's all about YouTube algorithms, this and that. But it's actually entertaining. Just go check it out. I think you'll you'll enjoy that one. So, uh, Mark, awesome episode. I, I enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed it too. I had a lot of fun. I mean, you know, it, it, it could go on because we can keep talking. But you know what? We'll leave some awesomeness for next week here on Trampled Underfoot Podcast YouTube. Have a good night, y'all. Good night. <laughs>